Hi, everyone. Michael Britt here. Now, I'm very proud that the Psych Files podcast has been so successful. It passed the 20 million download mark. And a lot of that success is due to my episodes on how you can use proven memory strategies to remember just about anything, from memorizing terms for a test to remembering people's names at a party or a meeting. So I put all of these episodes into one audio course. Hippos, aliens, and llamas quickly master the tricks to a great memory. And it's available now on avid.fm slash memorymaster. All one word. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 331 of The Psych Files. What are we going to do about all the mass shootings in the United States? There's kind of a knee-jerk reaction to blame either video games or mental illness. I mean, these people have to be mentally ill, right, in order to commit these sorts of horrific crimes? Well, the answer to that is no. And so I wanted to talk to you in this episode, kind of go back to a theory that I've talked about before. It's called Significance Quest Theory, and it applies itself quite well to what we've been experiencing here in the U.S. And so it's a, um, it's a nuanced answer, and this theory provides us with a number of reasons why you don't have to be mentally ill to commit atrocious acts like this. But you do have to have experienced a number of factors that added together put you in a place where you could commit a crime. So let's tackle in this episode this issue of whether we're talking about mental illness or something else. So when we have another mass shooting here in the U.S., that being, I think they defined it as um, someone killing three or more people, it's, it's disturbingly, it, it just happens so often. It, it is incredible how much it is happening. There are explanations at a variety of levels, including a, you know, sort of a sociological level, demographic level, but I want to look at it from a psychological level. And I'm especially concerned about the, the number of times that mental illness is brought up. And I, 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 I can understand why it would be, because you might say to yourself, you hear about someone walking into a mall and you know shooting a dozen people, and your first reaction is probably, well, that guy must be crazy. Right. You have to be. It's almost by, by definition, in order to do that, you must be mentally ill, uh, which is an unfortunate uh, knee-jerk reaction uh, for a number of reasons. One is it's probably wrong. Have some of these shooters had a mental illness? Um, probably. What that number is, we don't know. But it's a problematic answer to give or explanation to give. Because, first off, there, there are so many people who are experiencing a wide variety of mental illnesses. And, and again, it, mental illness is not a black and white sort of thing. You have it, you don't have it. And we know that we all suffer from various forms of psychological distress, anxiety, depression, uh, on a wide scale. And so th there is no place beyond which you become mentally ill, quote, unquote. So I, you worry about that being an explanation because there, there are so many people who suffer from various psychological disorders and you worry that there might be a, you know, let's put them in a category and call them dangerous. Uh, so that's one. But the other one is that it's a simplistic answer and, and really an answer like saying, uh, well, it's because of video games. It, it's really an explanation that is meant to just uh, settle the matter. Well, there it is. It's this. We, we take care of that. We take care of the, the whole problem. And as usual, human behavior is very complex. The reason we do things is not because of one thing. So that's what I want to look at in this episode is what are the, the many things. And I'm not going to I'm not going to talk about 100 things. <laughs> Here I want to talk about maybe the eight things that are uh, components of the significance quest theory. Because I think what's going to happen is you're going to hear these and what I think will happen is you'll realize that it becomes harder and harder for us to say, well, look, uh, you know, I'm not mentally ill. I know I would never do that. 
with the right conditions in place, what social psychology has taught us, under the, I hate to use the word right, but under certain circumstances, you might be very surprised at what you're capable of doing. So how might you be capable? How might you go down that road that leads you to committing such a horrific crime? Let's take a look at what significance quest theory says are the important factors. Okay, so the first component of their model uh, states that for an individual to become eventually uh, capable of extreme violence, it usually starts with triggering events. So something happens to you, it's either an individual event or a number of events over time, that lead you to a profound sense of loss of significance. Okay, it's kind of actually triggering events and loss of significance are, are kind of the first two components. What's a triggering event? Well, it's anything. If you imagine it, if, if what sort of event would lead a person to feel awful about themselves? And it might be, uh, the first one that might come to mind, of course, is, is bullying. It would be a, a marginalization would be maybe another one. In other words, isolation. So imagine a, uh, you know, an adolescent male, and he's different for some reason. I'll take males because there's a couple other reasons that it's probably males. Um, you know, maybe he's kind of dorky, if you will, if we want to use that term. He's not, he doesn't fit the definition of kind of a handsome, cute guy. He's, um, you know, he's quiet probably. And so he gets either physically bullied or just isolated. In other words, nobody wants to sit with this kid. Uh, nobody wants to be near him or play games with him. And, and believe me, you're, there's, a, there's, more, there's more components coming up. But we start with an individual who is just simply struggling to be liked. And we know from uh, psychologists, developmental psychologists, uh, and, and if you're either in adolescence right now, or were at one time, you remember how, how incredibly difficult or how much you wanted to fit in. And you remember in high school, there's all these groups, there's the jocks, and there's the, you know, the theater kids, and there's the, you know, I don't know what you might want to call them, you know, the nerds. Everybody gets into a group to help them define themselves. And that's one of the key challenges of this period of time. Who am I? Who am I like? Where do I fit in? Now, suppose you don't fit in well anywhere. Or suppose if the group you fit in, maybe it's the, you know, the nerds, gets constantly bullied, made fun of, isolated. When you do that at a time when you're an adolescent and so desperately need acceptance, this puts someone at high risk. What has to happen next? There are some possible positive ways that this can resolve itself. Uh, for example, if a person feels, let's take this hypothetical person that we're drawing here, not fitting in anywhere, getting bullied, being isolated, if that person can find activities that give them a sense of self-worth, that triggering event or events can be dealt with. If you have parenting, family support that's there for you when you come home from school and, and can say to you and help you to deal with what you're dealing with, sort of restore your self-worth when it's been attacked. Family support or close friends can do a lot to give your sense of significance back to you. But if it's not there and you can't find activities, you know, we, we look at activities like, uh, you know, the, the, the traditional clubs that you join in high school. So you can be on the, the newspaper team. If you can find a group that are like you and a group of people who can support you, then the bullying can be dealt with. If not... You sort of continue along this this period of time where you're highly vulnerable. And what the theory suggests is after a while, you're going to have what they call a need for closure. 
you're going to feel a, a strong need to get back at those who are doing this to you. How do you become significant? And so the need for closure is very strong if you have no other supports to help you to deal with these triggering events and the loss of significance. So you are wandering, meandering through adolescence. And the theory says that if you are exposed to two things that, that could really bring you closer to violent acts, one of them is what they call narrative. And so if you start reading online, and this is where uh, there's also been a lot of talk about hate groups online. If you fall into one of those groups, you're going to start to find other people who have experienced triggering events and who also have not been able to get out of that, to, to have their sense of worth restored. And so instead, anger develops. And these groups online have explanations, sometimes conspiracy theories, as to why you feel the way you do. As I say, if you can find no other place to go, these hate groups are going to make a lot of sense to you. They give you at least some kind of explanation for why you're treated like garbage and you don't fit in. So that's what they call narrative. Their next component is network. And this is where you not only read stuff that's online, but you start to make friends with people who adhere to that philosophy. And you start getting kind of sucked into that group itself. And this is where you're at the point where you could commit uh, a violent act. And that act is totally justified to you, given what you now believe about those other people who have made you feel so terrible, who have oppressed you and people like you. Okay, so triggering events, loss of significance, the need for closure, falling into narratives or hate-filled narratives, becoming a part of a network of others in this situation can lead to... So this person is not mentally ill, okay? This is a series of circumstances that have led the person to a really bad place. Okay, and the good thing about having models like significance quest theory is that they can explain the problem, but they can also be prescriptive. They can give suggestions as to how we can address each of those components and prevent that final violent act from occurring. All right. The first component of the model of triggering events. Well, this goes back to a really big question we've been asking ourselves a long time. If bullying someone or marginalizing someone, well, let's take bullying first. That, that's, bullying is usually an overt sort of act. Well, there's certainly plenty of you know, anti-bullying programs of varying effectiveness. It's going to be tough to ad address bullying because, again, getting back to what I said earlier, you know, this is a, this is a, a tough time, adolescence. Kids are jockeying for position. It's going to be hard, especially among men, to prevent them from pushing each other around. And that's partly, though, because of another thing that I've talked about previously, and that's precarious manhood. So why do we do this? And yes, we're trying to find out who we are, but why do men have to add the element, you know, a physical element to it? I'll link to an earlier episode where I talked about precarious manhood, but essentially the idea is that men, at least the way we do things in, in the U.S., of course, many Western countries, um, men have to earn their manhood. And this is something that, that everyone seems to recognize, that you, you have to go through some sort of a, of a rite of passage in order to become a man, in order to prove that you're a man. And this is unfortunate that this has become such a prevalent idea in our society because, because, of course, it's not necessary to have to prove your manhood. And so we can prevent triggering events, if one of those is bullying, by when we bring up our children, they become men 
not through physical violence. If you're not getting that message, then you're going to be more likely to be vulnerable to what can happen after some kind of triggering event. Racism, of course, fits in here as well. I mean, uh, stereotyping, discrimination, all of those things that place our particularly vulnerable adolescent male into situations where he could begin to feel very much like he's an outcast. And those are, those are all triggering events, walking down the street, seeing awful messages being sprawled on walls about your religion, for example, or your ethnic background. Those are minor uh, triggering events, but if they happen enough, they turn into major ones. It comes back to us as parents to make sure that we're bringing up kids who are tolerant. Not only tolerant, but curious accepting and even embracing people who are different from ourselves. This letting go of precarious manhood or or this need for men to prove that they're men, that's going to take time. In the meantime, we're going to have bullying. That is going to lead to a loss of significance. We have to be aware of it, And and you do hear that, that in high schools, kids are being told, keep an eye out. For the kid who looks like he's just, he's lonely, he's been outcast, bring that kid in. And that's a really important message. We need to bring those kids back into the fold, if you will, make them a part of our our activities. Even with the bullying, that's going to help them to deal with the loss of significance. As well as having activities, not just one activity, but but, um, regular ongoing activities for them to be involved in. I mean, you know, I think about things like, you know, this is very square. (laughs) I know there were activities in our high school where kids went to uh, nursing homes and and helped the people out there. That is, I think, a great way for young people to get a a, a greater perspective on life and, and how important a part they can play in helping those folks. Animals is another thing, though. You know, rescuing animals and caring for them, that, that, those sorts of things can lead to uh, increasing one's sense of significance. So if we can prevent, individ- we may not be able to prevent bullying, but if we can deal with catch at the right time when someone is feeling a loss of significance and intervene at that point, then we won't leave them in a place where they will be needing some kind of closure, the third part of uh, this model. There will not be a desperate need for this person to look for a simple way to get back at those people and those forces that have put them into this outcast position. So what happens when you're looking for that sort of thing? I mentioned narrative. So there's been a lot of talk. If there's so much hate speech online, why don't we just shut those sites down? And to be honest, I was sort of in favor of this. I thought, well, why, why don't we shut down hatred? The, the large companies, the Facebooks, etc., they are looking for ways to prevent hate messages from getting through. Okay, difficult to do, but worth doing. And so that will be less likely to get these kinds of hate narratives into the hands of vulnerable adolescents. Now, there was an article in uh, Time magazine about why, well, the quote is, why blocking hate sites like 8chan may only make them stronger. And so they make a few good points. Let me just quote from them. Uh, here's, here's a good quote. Blocking access to these platforms would validate users' long-running narrative that the mainstream simply can't deal with their edginess. They even use the word narrative there. When you block a site, you, you validate, right? There, you, and you even validate some of those, those uh, conspiracy theories. You, you, you validate the, the hatred against those who you feel have put you into this, who have, have treated you unfairly. Another quote from this article, much of the content is designed to shock and laugh at those who are offended. They are strewn with in-jokes, trolling, and red herrings, with the twin aims of winking to the community and mislead unwitting, horrified journalists. Again, all this is done actually to get more attention to their site. Here's a, here's a 
Really good quote. The most important thing these sites would offer a would-be gunman is companionship, recognition, and ultimately an audience to impress. It's the desire for this sense of belonging that deserves far more of our focus. Right? That sense of wanting to belong, to be part of. We need to make sure we need to make sure that they don't want to be a part of these hate groups. So that gets back to the activities uh, and just the bringing these people back into the fun, important activities that kids are involved in in high school. This has really got me back and forth. It seems like we ought to get rid of these areas of hate, but now the Internet makes it so easy to just, as they say here, it's kind of like whack-a-mole. You shut this down and they'll open up over here. I mean, yeah, but I don't know that that means we shouldn't shut them down. If Even if we make it a little bit harder to find these these hate narratives, uh, then we decrease the chances that our vulnerable person is going to find them. The other narrative that we hear, unfortunately, is we're getting messages from those in politics that reinforce a feeling of us and them. When we lose the message that our country is made great by the mixing of us and them, but instead that they're doing this and they're doing that, that reduces the complexities to black and white, and then, again, makes it easier to accept some kind of extreme solution. Models like significance quest theory are not the simple, here's the problem right here, this one. We solve the problem when we address all of these issues. And the thing, again, I'll return to here, is that I hope you see that The picture that we've drawn of a young person experiencing triggering events, a loss of significance, a need for closure. Imagine yourself going through that. It's not mental illness that leads to these awful events. And I'm going to leave out any discussion of the easy availability of dangerous weapons. Because I want to just focus on what puts us up to that point. What can we do about those factors to prevent mass shootings? One last thing. Remember to check out my memory course. You can use these strategies to get better grades on your tests, to remember people's names, and even help you to remember those jokes you keep forgetting. So you will be amazed. Avid.fm slash memory master. That's avid, A-V-I-D dot F-M slash memory master. Thanks.